Good morning, everybody, for the next few seconds. It's morning anyway. This is the part of the show where I let the clock on the wall do its 12 o'clock bong, bong, bong in the other room. And we sit and watch this screen saying that I will start shortly. And when the clock on the wall stops bong, bong, bonging, I will go ahead and take it away and say, Hey y'all, happy Sunday. Glad to see you here. Thank you for joining me and spending part of your Sunday with me. I uh, do really do appreciate it. Uh, welcome to uh, live Q&A number 42. 42, holy cow. Oh man. Seems like one a week is just enough, but not quite enough sometimes, I'm telling you. Uh, before we get going, I want to uh, say hi to everybody out here in the chat. Let's take a quick roll call, see who we've got. Looks like we have Mr. Matt Haas, Mr. Awesome Wood Things. Y'all need to go check out his channel. He's got some truly awesome stuff over there. Uh, Steve Nealon. From Harneel Media, the webmaster to the stars and wannabes like me. Uh, he's your guy for a website. Uh, there's a link in the description box below to harnealmedia.com. Uh, if you want just a little um, uh, a merch store or uh, you want a web store to sell items, uh, merch, as I mentioned, he can help you hook you up with a uh, print-on-demand service that will take care of you. And does an excellent job. Uh, if you want a full-blown website, he'll do as much or as little as you want to do. Um, a good guy. He does specializes in uh, websites for makers and the makers community at makers prices. So, I can't say enough good about him. Um, let's see, Mr. Mario Medina. Good morning, Mario. Good afternoon now. It's officially afternoon here. Ice Cream 62 from Italy. Hope you're doing well as well, my friend. Uh, Jeff Rozak from Florida. Mr. Ronald Ledger. I did get your, uh, your comment did come through. YouTube has a problem with the link. I will address your question, though. Um, let's see, from Bedford QC. Holy cow. Um, for some reason, I was thinking you were in the U.S. I don't know why I was thinking that, Ronald, but welcome aboard. Steve Gronsky, how you doing? Checking in from Oklahoma. Uh, let's see, Dave Kraus in Michigan. Dale Francis in Utah. Uh, let's see, Michael Bell, Jerry Bonifield. Francisco Paz from Rio de Janeiro. I've got something to tell you folks in Mexico and Brazil in just a couple seconds. Uh, Kevin Ells. Javi checking in from all right now. I don't know if you're in South Florida right now. I think you're up on the property in Central Florida. I'm not sure. But wherever you are, thank you for being here. Uh, Dwayne Ruthig from Michigan, David Dietrich, Mike and Amy from North Carolina, Mr. Michael Casey from Florida, Steve Late, uh, John Casca from Canada, uh, Carl Gerke from Indiana. I don't know if that's Gerke or Gerke, whichever you pronounce it. Sorry for butchering it. Uh, let's see, uh, Mike Urbani. Ian Foote from London. Welcome aboard. Jeff Smith from Sarasota. Uh, let's see. Uh, Woody Wan. Jeff from Woody Wan in Connecticut. My Views from o Oklahoma City. Percy Kuka. I'm going to butcher your name and I apologize it up for it up front. Auger Mage from South Carolina. Tim. Okay. William Finley and my views. All right. Well, welcome aboard, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, video that I put out this morning, which looking back at it now, I confused myself at the start. 
that was uh, there was a lot of opening new sessions and closing when there did really didn't need to be. Um, this wasn't a very good demonstration. The, the beginning part of this video, um, basically talking about creating a custom clip art library, and the main reason I did it was because I found that I was using the same vectors over and over again, using some of the same models that I had created and using some of the same vectors I'd created for other projects. And instead of trying to remember where the heck they were and going back and loading that in, I thought, well, what if I just saved those vectors only as 2D vector files and then put them into a custom folder uh, in my clip art library? And sure enough, it works. So it... Uh, it was a little tip that I'd picked up a couple of years ago, but completely and totally forgot. And if, you, if you've been hanging around with me for a while, you know that I do that a lot. I'll learn something, then forget I even knew it. And then suddenly it pops into my brain. I'm like, oh yeah, this was cool. So um, there's going to be a few more videos like that coming from further down the road. Believe me. Um things flash in and out of my mind and I don't think anybody knows and remembers 100% of the software. I'm sure even the developers and the guys who make a living teaching this stuff, I I don't think even, I'm, I'm sure they even need some refreshers every once in a while, you know, just how the heck did I do that? That kind of thing. And that's what I'm going through right now. But anyway, uh, the whole purpose of today's video was to show you how you can put the clip art that you use a lot or the vectors or the 3D models that you use a lot into one folder and save them there for use in your clip art library. And so they're right there handy in the software. You don't have to go hunting for them anymore. Because if you're anything like me, I've got a ton of files. I've got a ton of vectors and a ton of models that they're, they're in kind of a disorganized pile. You know, much like my closet. <laughs> and by being able to put them someplace that's quick and handy makes things a heck of a lot easier for everybody. So, um, let's see, uh, we had a couple of questions that came up in the comments that I didn't even think about addressing in the video. And, uh, like Steve Gronsky asked a real good question. Uh, he says, Mark, when doing this, meaning creating the clip art to put into the library, does it only save the vectors or would the tool paths also be saved? Um, it only saves the vectors. And that's the important point. Because if you're going to incorporate, like I used in that example, the VW bug that I engraved. If I was going to incorporate that into another sign, I might not want to use those tool paths. I might want to use something different. And... In fact, it's probably going to be pretty likely I would want to change the tool paths either because I'm going to use a different bit or different thickness of material or something or combine it with more vectors to add. So I just want to save the artwork itself. And that's so that's all it's going to save. Uh, if you're going to use the tool paths, your best bet would be to just load that file with all the tool pathing. Go up to the file menu, click save as, and save it under a different name. And then modify the whole file. That's the best way to do that for me personally. So, um, there was another comment... Um, let's see, David Dietrich pointed out something to me that uh, I was not aware of, and thank you for this. After adding the clip art to the clip art folder, you don't necessarily need to 
uh, restart vCarver Aspire to get the new clip art to show up in the clip art library. If you click on a different directory, and here what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll do a screen share here of Aspire. And we'll maximize this view over here just because I prefer to. If we're working in the My Clip Art folder and you add something to it, you don't have to shut down Aspire or VCarve and load it back up. You can just go into another folder and then come back to that folder and it will update when it reloads. That I was not aware of. So thank you for that, David. I really do appreciate the... Uh, that info on that. That makes things a heck of a lot easier. So let's get back over here to where y'all are and uh, go from there. Let's see. Another question or comment was from Ice Cream 62. Now I should have went ahead and kept my screen share up for this. He says maybe it's possible to refresh the clip arts clicking on the round arrows near the little cloud or in one of the little preview squares at the right without the need to close and restart the program. Okay, well, let's bring it back up here and screen share again. And what he's referring to is this little area right in here. What this does, let me go back into my clip art folder from Vectric, okay? Every time you load the software, it will go online and search their cloud service for any new clip art that they have added to the collection. If you've been using it for a while, what you can do is you can click on this button right here and what it does, ah, you have to uh, log into your VN Company account. You go to open the website, log into your VN Company account, then click that button and it will refresh the um, all of the clip art down here with any new models they may have added. So that's what that button does. Here you click this button and what it is is it's showing only the files that you have downloaded to your computer. If you don't, if you have downloaded all of them, it's going to show all of them. If you have not downloaded all of them, then those won't appear here. So, personally, I... Uh, I just uh, leave it as is. If I don't have something, there is a little symbol. I think I've got everything downloaded. Yes, I do. There is a little symbol around the thumbnail that uh, it, it's shaded in gray and has a little download icon over here to the, to the right side of the thumbnail view, letting you know that it's available for download, but you don't have it. And all you need to do is click on that and it'll download it into your computer. So that's what the these two do here. They don't have anything to do with any of the folders you have on your computer. So hope that answers that. Okay. Let's see. Let me get back over here to y'all. So I can check this out now. So, um, the real quick announcement that I was going to make for the folks in uh, Mexico and Brazil is, I just discovered that, okay, let me back up a minute and regroup here. I close caption all of my videos, and you can access those closed captions by putting your cursor error arrow over the video screen, the panel there, and you'll see the little CC symbol down at the bottom. You can click on that CC symbol and that will bring up the closed captions. 
but it will also let you select the language. Now, all of my videos have been closed captioned in English. But what I'm doing now, I just discovered last week that I can also do an auto translate through Google's auto translate into several different languages. So I have enabled the auto translate for Portuguese for Brazil and Spanish for Mexico. So if there is some terminology that I get wrong or something, I will go in and I clarify everything in the closed captions and then Google Translate translates it to Portuguese for Brazil and Spanish for Mexico. Now, if there are some other language that other languages that some of you folks would like to have, I will do my best to try to get them in there. But for the folks in Brazil and the folks in Mexico, do know that I have enabled the uh, uh, Google Translate. It's automatic translations. I have nothing to do with it. I don't speak Portuguese and I don't speak Spanish. I know a little bit of Spanish, enough to get me fed and enough to get me in trouble. But um, it it's an auto translation. And if you would, I would like some feedback on that to see if that's accurate or not. And if there are any other languages any of you would like for me to try to do the uh, automatic translation for closed captions, please let me know. Um, I want to try to get this to as many folks as would like to see it. So if your language isn't represented, represented or represented, um, please let me know. Now, only the last three or four videos have this translation. I'm trying it out to see if it helps. But I went back through my analytics to see what were the most popular foreign countries from the U.S., that is, that uh, folks were watching from. And Brazil and Mexico were the two biggest. So if this is, if this is a service that you like, um, then uh, please let me know. If it's, you know if, it's, if it's not a very good translation, please let me know. And I'll do what I can to get that fixed. So anyway, it, it's an option. So um, let me go back in here because we are getting some questions and I promise I will get to you, Ronald Ledger, uh, because that is an excellent question, by the way. Uh, let's see. I'm scrolling back up here to see the questions that we have. Okay, Tim says, Hi, Mark. I'm looking for a rotary axis without the motor. Any suggestions? Um, not really. Uh, every rotary axis setup that I have seen so far comes with a motor. Uh, now, you don't necessarily have to use that motor. Um, I mean, mine, when I ordered my rotary axis kit, um, it came with a motor that I couldn't use because the amperage was completely different. And uh, after talking with the gentleman who made my controller box, he recommended, no, don't use that motor. Now, it's easy to say, yeah, he just wanted you to buy another motor. That wasn't the case. He knew I had a spare motor here on hand. So he wasn't going to get a sale out of it. He just let me know that it, the, the, the uh, amperage imbalance would cause that... Uh, other motor to run too hot and he didn't recommend it. So that's the only reason that I went ahead and swapped out that motor. As far as buying one without the motor, um, maybe if you go to like AliExpress or something like that, you can talk with a manufacturer about shipping you one without a motor. But right now I really don't know of one that doesn't have a motor with it. And I don't know that the price savings would be really that much because stepper motors are not expensive. Um, they're anywhere from, heck, I've seen them as cheap as $15 up into, you know, a couple of hundred, depending upon what you want. But uh, just basically put, um, I, I really don't know. I, I don't know of a rotary axis kit that doesn't come with the motor. So, 
All righty, let's see here. Going back through. Oh, boy. Let's see. Scotia3D wants to know, could we color carve stuff with laser or stick to or stick to stain sponge? Um, you certainly could use a laser. A lot of people do. Uh, I don't know what you mean. Okay, stick to stain. All right. Um, you, you're only limited by your imagination. And I know that's a cliche and it sounds really cheesy, but um, it is the truth. I mean, I use paint. I use stained. I know people that use the um, acrylic crayons and oil crayons. I know people that just use uh, felt pens like a Sharpie so uh, or colored pencils. It's 100% up to you. Using a laser, certainly. You know, uh, I know several people that do that. Let's see. Troy Pritchard wants to know, can you put a folder within a folder, such as my clip art, and within that folder, create another folder for things like my clip art, trees or cars or flowers, etc.? I believe you can. But I'm not certain. I didn't try it. Um, in fact, you know what? Let's experiment right now. Always up for a challenge. Let me go ahead and bring up a spire. And we'll do that. Um, I will also open up um, my clip art folder here. And let's create a folder within it. New folder. And come along, Windows. I know you got a lot of stuff going on. And I'll call it VW. Hit Enter. And I'll go ahead and move that clip art into there. So now, when I come up in here, I'll just click on this one. We've loaded that. And now we'll go down to my clip art. It loaded the folder right there. So yes, you can create subfolders. We all learned something right here live. That's very cool. And thank you for that idea. So now if I just click on that folder, it shows only the stuff within that subfolder. All right. Well, hey, Troy, great idea. Thank you very much for that idea. All right. That's actually very cool. And that's going to help out even more. So great. I love that. <laughs> See, y'all come up with stuff that I would never even think about doing. And uh, I love that. <laughs> so thank you, Troy. Um, okay, thank you, Mario and Francisco. I really appreciate it. Okay, Percy Kuka wants to know, for V-carving, is it right to set the step over at 10 to 12% of the diameter of the V-bit? Um I, on a V-bit, I set my step over to about 4%. It, depending upon how small the object is, I might go 2%. Because when you're using a V-bit that comes to a sharp point to move back and forth and clear out an area, it's going to leave ridges. And so if you get that step over real tiny, you can make those ridges as close together and as small as possible. Um, now, I have yet to have a project come off of the machine that is uh, finish ready. There is always going to be some sanding. And that's why I use the nylon abrasive bristle brushes and the um, Scotch-Brite rotary discs on my uh, little Dremel rotary tool for sanding. But I do get it if... You know, I'm a home hobbyist and I can afford to take the time. If you're in a high production environment, maybe you can't afford to take that time. Um, I would just say experiment and see what you come up with. You, the, downside, the downside to setting a smaller step over is it's going to take more time to machine. If you are fine with doing cleanup sanding, 10 or 12% may be fine for you. And on a larger piece, it may be okay for you. But on a real small people, people, on a real small project, where did I come up with people? Man, 
um, and you're in real small areas that's hard to get into to sand, um, a smaller step over would probably be better. Um, also, what would be the right feed rate? Is it okay to go 130? Certainly. I mean, it's, it's up to you. It's, it, there are so many variables, which is why I stay out of the feed rate uh, arguments all the time, is because the feed rate is going to depend on the material, the bit, and the machine. Some machines can handle 300 inches per minute, but the bit and the material can't. So you're just going to have to experiment and find that that sweet spot right in the middle there where you're getting a good result and it's moving fairly quickly. You know, you, you, you want to get the right speed and the right end result. It's great to be able to cut at 600 inches per minute and get it off the machine in five minutes. But if you're going to spend two hours sanding it, it makes sense to slow down the cutting and maybe spend, you know, 20 to 30 minutes cutting. That's my attitude anyway. It's, it, it's great to say you cut a thousand pieces on the machine today. But if we're still both only putting out 500 pieces a week because I'm running slower and you haven't finished sanding all 1,000, then, you know, it's a trade-off. So, but experiment, and that's what it's all about. So, um, also, what should be the step down? I'm guessing you're saying the plunge rate, your uh, uh, depth per pass, your pass depth. That's what it is. I couldn't remember the words. Um, I generally speaking go with half of the bit's diameter at the maximum. And again, that's going to change depending upon the material and depending upon the machine. Some machines can handle um, a, a real deep, you know, uh, cutting. Some, some people can cut through 18 or 19 millimeter material, three quarter inch material in one pass. And if your machine will do that, great. Some can't. That's one of those things that you're going to have to experiment with. And Dave Matthews just threw in something going slower breaks fewer bits. And that's true. Also, cutting shallower per pass breaks fewer bits. Because you can be cutting along nice and slow, but if you're cutting too deep, you're putting just as much stress on that tool as you would be if you were going faster. So it's it's kind of a balancing act there. Experiment. I mean, it's, it's, it's just experiment with it. So... Um, Mike Urbani wants to know, will this work with SVG files also? I have no idea, Mike. I really don't use SVG files. I may have one or two on my computer. I can experiment, but feel free to experiment as well. Um, I mean, you can set up a folder, throw an SVG file in it, load it. And if it doesn't work, you can always remove the folder. I mean, just right click that. Well, let me bring it up here. Um... Make sure I'm sharing. Yes, I am sharing, but I'm not sharing the right thing. You can always uh, bring that up. You can always select a folder and remove it right there. It won't delete the artwork off of your computer. It just removes that folder from the list. That's all. And then you can go back in and get rid of it. So experiment. I, I really don't know if it'll work with SVG files. I do know it'll work with DXF files. So if you have DXF files that you use a lot, you can put them in there. Like, for instance, um, we have here 2D game layouts, cribbage boards, etc. These are DXF files. Some of them are. Uh some of these are CRV files, but some of them are also DXF files. So, yes, it will work for those, but I really don't know about SVGs. So, let's go back over here to where you all are. Uh, Mario Medina says he can help with the Spanish. Thank you very much, Mario. 
Okay, Cooper5741 says, I'm using VCarve Pro. Did you do any videos on guitar body making? Uh, no, I did not. Um, I have so many things on my list right now. I have not yet got into, and that was the whole reason for getting into CNC was for guitar work. I have not cut the first guitar project at all on my CNC. I mean, I've just been diving into it and having fun with it and totally forgot the whole reason for getting into it. So, um, also watch the video on making a fretboard. Did I do one with cutting fret slots using the CNC? No, I have not. But I can tell you, you're looking at using a end mill with a di diameter of about 22 to 23 thousandths. They are extremely delicate. In some materials, you're looking at feed rates in the single digits, like four, five, six inches per minute, because they are so delicate. And I know they're delicate because I got a 23 thousandths diameter end mill and taking it out of the package, dropped it. And of course it landed tip first on my concrete shop floor and shattered into about six pieces before it ever got even chucked into the uh, router. So do not use a touch plate with small diameter bits. Don't do it. Just bringing down to touch off will shatter that bit. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know that. Um, use the little paper method for uh, setting the uh, zero, your Z0 on a small diameter bit like that. They are very delicate. So, uh, no, actually, I have not done any guitar building videos since I got into CNC, I have not done anything cutting at all on a guitar. Uh, let's see. Is it possible to make a radius and a spire? What type of radius are you talking about? Are you talking about radius between vectors? Are you talking about a dome shape uh, or something like that? Um, two rail sweep is a good option for making something like a curved piece of molding or something like that. So <coughs> that was from Boss X, by the way. Uh, let's see. Doug Rothenberger wants to know, are there special steps to take when attempting to do a manual tool change partway through a job? Um, every time I try after changing the bit, restarting my Z axis moves the Z axis up and limits out. Okay. Um, that, that may or may not be a machine issue. Um, the only special steps I take for a manual tool change, and that's how I do it. I don't have an automatic tool changer and I don't know that I know anybody that does that isn't running a professional machine. Um, I will get to the point where I need to do to do the tool change, swap out my bits, and then all I do is I reset my Z0. I use a touch plate, um, and but some people use the paper method. Some people just, I know like Peter Pasuelo uses a flashlight behind the bit, and he just uh, brings the tip down until he no longer sees light coming out from the bottom of the bit. And then he sets his Z0. Uh, but you do have to do that. You have to reset your Z0. After that, I don't know why your Z would be moving up to limit out. That might be a machine issue. And I can't help anybody tech support their machine. Because mainly, I don't know your machine. I know my equipment. I've not used any thing other than my equipment. So I can't help you with like a Shape Oko, Shop Saber, uh, CNC Shark or anything like that because I don't know the machine. Uh, I would go to the machine manufacturer's website, look for either community or support and see if there is a community or support forum or even a Facebook group. Uh, a lot of manufacturers now have a Facebook group. And these are all people that use your machine 
and have been there, done that, found a fix, found an answer. And uh, that's what they do. They share tips and tricks. They share files and artwork and methods and techniques and help people troubleshoot and solve problems. So I would definitely look for a support community for your machine and go from there. Uh, let's see. Troy Pritchard says Dave Gatton uses a laser to make fret grooves. He uses a laser to make fret indicators and to mark where the fret goes. Uh, he's also done um, used a V-bit to do the same thing, where you're just using a V-bit to make a very small little mark on the fretboard to indicate where that fret slot goes. And then you come back with a fret saw and your own rig. That's the way I would do it. Um, I would um, somehow mark the fret slot and then cut it with the fret saw. Uh, that's just the way I prefer to do it. I prefer to hand cut my frets and do everything else that way by hand. Uh, I've also never carved a neck. I prefer, I like getting out there with the files and the rasps and the chisels and carving the back of a neck myself. Um, I just prefer to do it that way. So I've never even modeled a guitar neck. So I have modeled the outline, the profile of like a Stratocaster neck, and that's fine, but I like that carving by hand. So, uh, let's see. Percy Kuka says, cutting plastics like HDPE, the cutting pass is set at 12 passes. At times, part gets cut within seven passes, even though it's been set to 12. Is this an operational issue while setting the Z-axis? It may be. It may be you didn't have the correct material thickness entered. If the material is set up for 18 millimeters and the file is set up for 18 millimeter material and you only use 12 millimeter material, that could be your issue. Um, if I'm doing, I don't have very many files like this, but there are a couple of files where I might use it on three quarter inch material and some I might use on half inch material. I have files for both thicknesses. And then I just have to keep in mind which one I'm using. And I keep them in separate folders so that I know they're <laughs> for different thicknesses. So, uh, let's see. Doug Rothenberger saying uh, the steps are click the stop button to move the head to change bit. Reset Z-axis, leave X and Y alone, click Start button, then the head moves up in the Z-axis and hits the limits and goes into emergency stop. Yeah, that, that, may be, that may be either a machine issue or a programming issue. Let me ask you this. Are you putting all of your G-code into one file? Because what I do is... I, I set up different files. Uh, like if I am V-carving something and using a clearance bit, I have one piece of G-code for the V-bit, one piece of G-code for the large area clearance tool, and then another piece of G-code for the profile cutout. And I have zero problems that way. It only takes a few seconds to load the G-code. You know, just to close file, then load the new G code file. That only takes about five seconds. So I don't put all my G code into one file. So that may help. Um, let's see. Dave Matthews, I use something like a 15 to 20 degree V bit cutting 10 to 15 thousands deep to mark where to put the frets. The saw caught in the groove nicely and made it easy. Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, David Dietrich, my experimenter. Dude, you are the man. I just imported an SVG file into Aspire, saved it to my ClipArt folder, and it shows up in my ClipArt library. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <sighs> Let's see. Cooper 5741. When marking for the guitar frets, I assume you put tabs in, so when you put the fretboard in the fret jig, it stays square. 
then cut the tabs off later? Or did you use sticky tape? Um, personally, um, well, it would just depend on the type of fretboard you're making. Now, um, it's for like banjo, cigar box guitar, things like that. Most of the fretboards are not tapered. But I see where you're getting, uh, what, uh, where you, what you're getting at. Yes, you would want to leave some sort of a, you would want to leave the material using tabs so that when you put the uh, fretboard into your uh, fretting guide, your fret saw guide, it stays square and your fret slots stay straight and are not crooked a little bit. Um, yeah, that would be a good way to go. Put tabs in so when you put it in the fretting jig, it stays square. Right. Yeah, that's that would be the way to go. Okay, let's see. Joni Jensen, I can see me using a lot more of my own clip art folders now. Hey, I'm always here to try to help. And if that means you just kind of uh, got a new hobby reorganizing your, <laughs> your vectors and your 3D models... I apologize. <laughs> so, yeah, Doug Rothenberger, thank you. I've been putting all my G code in one file. I, I know a lot of people that do that, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Now, having said that, what I will do is I will put all the G code that uses the same bit into one file, but you got to be careful. Like, if um, you've got to think order of operations. Because it would be real easy to put the profile cutout that's going to cut the part out of the material somewhere other than last. And then cut out the profile, but there are still steps to be done. So 99 times out of 100, I'll put the profile cutout in its own separate G-code file so I don't make that mistake. That's the last thing I'll cut out. But other than that, if it's going to clear a couple of pockets with a quarter inch end mill and then um, drill some holes with the quarter inch end mill, I can put that pocket tool path and that drilling tool path in the same piece of G-code. And if I'm going to be V-carving with a V-bit and then doing a chamfered edge where the profile is going to be, I'll because they use the same V-bit, I'll put those in the same piece of G-code. But the profile cutout is always last and it's always separate. And that's just for my peace of mind because I know me. I will get something out of order and then I've got a piece cut out of the material and no way to hold it onto the table while other things have to be done. So, okay, well... It looks like that's about it for the questions. And holy cow, I've already been on here for 42 minutes. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody. I don't know what next week's video is going to be. But um, I, I've got maybe three different ideas. I just haven't picked one yet. I, I want to say sincerely thank you again. I, and if you have emailed me, I have received your email. I've got to talk with Ronald Ledger right now. Ronald Ledger. I almost forgot you. Um, your question, like I said, Facebook or Facebook, YouTube doesn't like the link that you posted. But he wants to know, I subscribe to and receive scroll saw art every day in PDF format. Then he has a link to an example. How would I be able to capture these vectors for vCarve Pro clip art. There can be many to a page. About the best way to handle that would be take them one on one. And I know you don't want to hear that. But as we just saw, you can set up a folder in your clip art file and put those PDFs there. Then you've got a couple of ways of doing this. It depends on how the PDF was set up. Some PDFs are just JPEG photo image captures. Some PDFs actually have vectors. You can try 
to import the vectors from that PDF, just go to, like I showed in the video this morning, file, import, import vectors, and look for that PDF. If there are any vectors there on those PDFs, then perfect. If not, you will have to load that PDF as a bitmap, trace that bitmap, then save those vectors for import into your clip art. Now, I didn't do a video on it because it is a copywritten image that I bought. Uh, but I did a, it was a scroll saw project that I bought from Charles Deering. That was a project for my granddaughter. And his scroll saw art is in PNG format. And I was able to um, import that bitmap into VCarve, trace it with a standard bitmap trace, cut it, and it turned out beautifully. So I know that does work, but unfortunately, you'll probably have to do them all one on one by one. And to be honest, that's the way you would want to do it anyway, was do all this work once, then save it to your um, clip art. So you only have to do it once. So uh, I'm sorry there's not an easier way, <laughs> but uh, sometimes you just can't get past having to do that legwork of going through and doing a, a bitmap trace. Now, having said that, 99 times out of 100 scroll saw projects are black and white, so you, or at least grayscale, so you have that high contrast. And when you're doing a bitmap trace on a scroll saw project, you can adjust that tolerance within the bitmap trace form and kind of get a lot better, a lot better uh, contrast so that you can trace that bitmap very well. So tracing a uh, scroll saw project is fairly easy and fairly straightforward. And because scroll sawers know you're looking for high contrast. Because you got to know what to cut out, what to leave behind. So that works to your benefit. So I hope that uh, helps you out. And I wanted to say again, now that I'm done with that, um, gee, many Christmas, almost 50 minutes. Uh, I want to say thank you very much for spending part of your Sunday with me. I Again, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um as far as next week is concerned yet, uh, it just depends, but, uh, hopefully it's a good one and I will be doing another live Q and a session every Sunday. If it's your first time here, we do this every week, every Sunday at noon Pacific time, U S 3 PM Eastern time, U S. And again, I, I value your input. If you have any suggestions for uh, a language that you would like to see the closed captions uh, translated to, please let me know. And if you would like to uh, take a look at those closed captions, make sure the Google Auto Translate did a good job and it didn't tell you to set your uh, Z0 to your daughter's pregnancy brings much joy to our city. You know, let me know. <laughs> So, all right. Thank you very much, y'all. I really do appreciate it. Y'all have a great day. And above all, get out and do something cool. Don't hang around the house watching mopes like me. Y'all got better stuff to do. Bye-bye, y'all. See you next week.